Channel Kathy. <laughs> so, great to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, how to seat. And then uh, what we're, we're going to introduce you, and then you can introduce everybody else. Does that sound all right? Oh, yes, it's okay. okay. <laughs> and um, these microphones here are all wired, but you can also stand at the podium if you Thank prefer. You it's whatever no, you no, prefer. I should sit here. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the order yeah, of speakers. Yeah, 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 I have everything. Okay, all right, sorry for that. This is, uh, we're ready to get underway now. My name is Mary Wareham. I'm the Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. And uh, since the beginning of the year, hum Human Rights Watch has been chairing the US campaign to ban landmines, a coalition of more than 400 non-governmental organizations that has been working for almost the last 20 years, uh, trying to convince the US government to ban landmines. So we're very happy to be able to help to organize this event uh, to together with our colleagues from the Mind Ban Treaty Support Unit. And maybe I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Mary. Uh, my name is Kerry Brinker. I'm the director of the Convention's Implementation Support Unit in, in Geneva. I th uh, we're, we're very pleased to collaborate with Human Rights Watch, the U.S. campaign to ban landmines uh, on this event. And uh, this collaboration, in a sense, is in keeping, I think, with the spirit of of, of a close partnership that has been uh, manifested in the work of this convention right from the outset. You know, Mary and her colleagues, of course, are central to the non-governmental campaign. I work for the states that are parties to the convention, and you see this, this kind of partnership uh, throughout the work of the convention. Not only are we pleased to collaborate with Mary and Human Rights Watch in the US campaign, but it's our, our privilege really to be implementing a European Union Council decision in support of the convention. Um, and it's, it's thanks to the European Union, I think, that we're able to hold events like this. And uh, we're gonna hear more about that, I believe, from the, uh, the deputy head of the European Union mission. And would you like me to proceed and... Uh, let me just say a couple of housekeeping things. We'll have, uh, there are three distinct sections to this event. First, our high-level panel, then we'll have a technical pause. We'll do our US panel presentation, facilitated by Rachel uh, from Stimson, and then we'll have our concluding remarks. Um, please tweet it if you would like. We've put the Wi-Fi address up there for you to get in online, uh, and we've got hashtags and all sorts of other good stuff on Twitter, and the bathrooms are just across the corridor here. So um, we've received RSVPs from uh, 30 countries for this event, uh, th 30 different diplomatic representatives here in Washington, D.C., uh, as well as from members of the U.S. campaign to ban landmines, uh, and from, from, from the Hill, from Hill staffers. And I'm not sure if there's any media in the room, but if there is, I'm happy to uh, talk you through what's, what, what, what's happening here. Uh, and the program contains all the information on, on our speakers. So I think that was all that I wanted to say, and I'll leave it to you now, Kerry, to introduce. Okay. Thank, thank you again, Mary. Um, yeah, again, we are the implementation supporting of the convention has been been uh, privileged to uh, be mandated to implement a European Union uh, effort to promote the implementation and universalization of the convention. And it's thanks to the, to the EU that uh, we're able to to see that events like this can take place. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that uh, the European Union's. Uh, uh, the deputy head of mission has has come here. Uh, I don't know if he remembers me, but I remember him because he he, <laughs> he he played a, a very significant role in in matters that relate to landmines and other explosive remnants of war through his, I guess your your previous life as a French diplomat and the head of the uh, uh, as the ambassador of, of France to the conference on disarmament in Geneva and his related work there. And now I see you're in in a, in a new manifestation as the deputy head of mission here in for the European Union in uh, Washington. So with that said, I would turn it over to Ambassador Rivaso to uh, deliver some opening remarks and to introduce the uh, panel at the front. Thank you very much. And uh, it's true that uh, when I look at the room and where I see a number of faces I know, particularly uh, the most honored one, uh, uh, Jody Williams, still goes. It's, I will not re recall how many years we met for the first time, <laughs> but uh, it illustrates the fact that great teams never die. Uh, it's a, a very special honor and a, a, a pleasure to be with all of you today and to have the heavy task to open this seminar, uh, this symposium on the United States and the 1987 Anti-Personal Mind Ban Convention. We used to say Ottawa Convention, as you know. Uh, 
I remember when uh, the first uh, efforts were launched by UST, by usually for this convention, and at that time, I have to bang my chest and say, we were not immediately convinced. <laughs> uh, but this is right. But maybe a woman alchemy operates with my ambassador at that time. At that time, I was not ambassador in Geneva. I was only number two in Geneva. I was a deputy, as I am here today. Uh, and uh, we decided, as the French government, to support you. Uh, and uh, that's how this treaty comes to life. And after that, you know that it's not a single child, but he has a smaller brother with the Oslo Convention, and maybe the family is not yet closed. Because the nice thing with treaties is that uh, a new one can uh, come to light uh, in uh, more than one lifetime. The European Union, since then, has struggled to follow the example that you have set. And as you know, since uh, last year, 1st of July, every 20, with Poland uh, joining finally uh, the ban, every 28 members of the European Union are unified under your banner. The European Union is now united in pursuing a mind-free world with a long history of support for ending the suffering caused by anti-personal minds and with uh, all its member states. Uh, by anticipation of this uh, unification, uh, on the 13th of November 2012, the Council of the European Union, in the context of what we call the European Security Strategy, because uh, we, we like very much these nice words, you know, when you are a bureaucracy, you, nice, you like nice words. <laughs> That's part of the problems. <laughs> uh, in the, uh, we adopted a decision, a Council decision, in support of implementation of uh, the Action Plan of Cartagena, 2010-2014. Uh, and within this Council decision, the European Union seeks to support efforts on part of state parties to the Convention to implement the mine clearance and victim assistance aspect of the Cartagena Action Plan, and also the universalization of the Convention and its norms. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, we, uh, we know how uh, big success, I think it's an unparalleled success in the humanitarian field, what the Ottawa Convention has achieved. But we still need money, we still have uh, people uh, uh, dying from landmines. Uh, we have a presence of 1% here who reminds us that. Uh, and uh, the EU, as uh, you know, has not limited resources. But uh, we have decided uh, to streamline our procedure to try to spare uh, as much as possible administrative costs. That's why, since some years, we don't have a specific budget, because we thought that uh, the managing uh, costs of having a specific budget were too high. <laughs> so if we wanted to, to give as much money as we wanted, we had to, to cut a bit the bureaucracy for once. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, it has been a success. It will continue. But at the same time, we know that humanitarian, if we don't want the humanitarian success to, to be also a sort of a Sisyphus uh, rock, uh, that we uh, always restart again, uh, we have to work on universalization. And that's why we are so honored to have you, Prince, with us, with a high level task force for universalization that you lead. Uh, and I remember how impressed I was when I met first with you uh, ten, almost 10 years ago. And I, I had hoped for uh, something like that. And I'm so happy that you have accepted this responsibility. Because it's uh, now uh, a difficult part, uh, which is for us, in front of us, we have to have uh, the main landmines producers of today joining one by one or accepting limitations. Uh, otherwise, landmines are available here and there, and you will always have illegal uh, smuggling system which will, uh, 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 which will uh, create new situation of crisis. So you extinguished a uh, fire here, then a new fire opened there. And the only way to, to avoid that is to make progress on universalization. Uh, that's why uh, I think this is very inspiring that uh, you are here. And I thank uh, Carnegie and all of you to be here. Uh, what the European Union is uh, doing with respect to universalization, we are providing funding to the implementation support unit, as you know, to carry out three initiatives. And these include organizing high-level engagement of states not party to the convention, carrying out a study on border security without the use of anti-personal mines, and staging national or regional workshops. Through workshops and symposiums like this event, we hope to advance a uh, fruitful discussion on ways and means to overcome real or perceived barriers to accession on the convention. As you know, 
the convention preambles states the desirability of having uh, uh, every member of a United Nation joining the convention, and it goes without saying that it would be highly desirable to have a United States finally join the anti-mine movement. Uh, we all know that uh, without the United States joining, uh, the chances for you to convince a uh, major uh, landmine producer are uh, seriously uh, <laughs> lower, unfortunately. Uh, I hope that we will hear a variety of creative views pointing to how this might be possible. And uh, uh, meanwhile, on the European Union, we are uh, working on a new uh, uh, reflection in preparation of uh, de to develop uh, an action plan with a view of a Maputo summit of 2014. So uh, if uh, you, you are interested, uh, we shall be here with you, myself and my colleague Rory Dom, and we, we could uh, discuss that with you. But meanwhile, I think I have to give uh, the floor now to uh, Jody Williams. Uh, you know uh, who she is. I don't need to remind you anything about her. Uh, just let me add that land, I hope landmines are continuing to be close to your heart and that the protection uh, uh, for world free of all forms of violence against women, which is also a great cause, will not uh, make you less Exactly. <laughs> yes, and this is yeah, and and this is uh, yes, and this is the next uh, maybe the next child. Uh, let's see if, if he is conceived in this uh, in these days. You know, <laughs> Jody, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to see you again after all these years. And Prince Mered, uh it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank right. you so much. And really, the diligence of the Prince and the high-level uh, universalization group and Carrie Brinkert of the ISU, the initials overcome me sometimes. Um, the efforts being made to continue to universalize this treaty. Um, sometimes people say that because 80% of the planet is part of the treaty, even the big powers are obeying parts of it. Maybe we shouldn't have such an emphasis on universalization at this point. I would uh, strongly disagree with that notion. And I will just speak generally about the US because the panel that follows knows a lot more about the US position at this moment than I do, uh, other than my general conversation with Steve Goose uh, of Human Rights Watch, who tries to keep me informed of the status of the uh, Obama administration's review of landmine policy. Um, I try to avoid hearing it because my frustration level <coughs> gets extremely high. Um, as you know, the landmine campaign was formally launched in October of 1992, which is a long time ago. And as you heard from my French colleague, in the beginning, very few, I would say nobody, believed that a handful of civil society organizations, a handful of individuals, would be able to change a perception about a weapon that had been used by virtually every fighting force in the world for almost a century. And I think that what was accomplished in that sense of civil society strategizing and planning and slowly winning over states as colleagues in the action is really a testament to what can happen in this world when we work together. The position of the US throughout that process was questionable, never fully embracing the movement to ban landmines, always wanting to preserve its own minds. Um, at times um, harmful to the process, and at times not harmful to the process. We were not surprised that Mr. Clinton did not sign the Mine Ban Treaty, um, even less, even expecting even more that Mr. Bush would not sign the treaty. And at this point, 
when Mr. Obama came to power, I think we were all hopeful, as we were about many things with President Obama, including taking serious action on nuclear weapons and then stepping back from that. But that's a whole nother story. Um, Mr. Obama has followed the, the position of Clinton and Bush in the sense of not taking a strong public position and falling back on the, I'm going to call it an excuse, and I'm trying to be very positive here today because I generally am not. I tend to be more hostile and cynical. So I'm trying to be upbeat because we really want the US to come on board. But I, I, it's impossible to see the review process which has been going on since the Clinton administration in various forms to be anything but a cover up to avoid making a decision on a weapon that my country has not used since the first Gulf War. Uh, the US was the first country to stop exporting landmines. We haven't produced since the mid 90s. And the US, as we know and we're very happy for, is one of the biggest contributors to mine action and survivor assistance. That is awesome. It's outstanding. Given that, it is quite frustrating or mind-boggling or confusing or any number of words that one could use to characterize um, the fact that they have not formally joined the mine ban treaty. Of course, he can't sign now. He would have to, ex you know, the Senate would have to accede to the treaty. Um, but if you're obeying it, why not join it? Now, you think about it a lot in the context of his coming to power talking a lot about wanting to reintroduce you, the United States to multilateralism. And many of us in the, in the international campaign, I would assume in the diplomatic community, and of course the US campaign took that as a very strong signal that maybe the landmine treaty was finally going to be sent to the Senate because it, was, it seemed a done deal, given that the US was following everything uh, related to the treaty. And then, of course, that didn't happen, and we went back to the review of landmines. And I keep trying to imagine, what can you be reviewing at this point about anti-personnel landmines? Um, it confuses me, but perhaps there's a lot more to them that I do not understand. On the other hand, um, Mr. Obama has been handed the results of the review, so we hear. Um, and as I said, the panel will talk about that. We don't know what they are. There are indications that it's positive, but God only knows what that means in the context of the United States and the Mind Ban Treaty. But um, Mr. Obama has declared 2014 as the year of action. Did I get that right, Jose? The year of action. And my feeling, my personal feeling, is that if he is not prepared to send the treaty to the Senate, he can take steps, he can take action as the executive that would put the US that much closer to ultimately joining the treaty. He could order the full destruction of the stockpile. Um, he could set a time limit. He could do any number of things. And if he's not going to send it to the Senate, we hope that he will do that, in addition to continuing to give significant funds for mine action and survivor assistance. But of course, it always helps to hear from other states that it matters. And so we're thrilled that so many of you are here today and hope that in um, your interactions with the United States, while thanking them, if, you, if you're from a mine-affected country that is receiving uh, funds from the US, while thanking them also mentioning, mentioning that closing the circle would be really useful, more than useful. 
that it would also inspire other countries that have not joined, and, you know, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, to consider it differently. They do, for, I was going to be mean, but I'm stopping. <laughs> They do pay attention to the United States on such issues. So <clears throat> it would be very helpful if the US were to fully embrace the Mine Bin Treaty and not just conform to parts of it. And I know that um, my good friend Prince Mered will continue pushing the US <clears throat> in his gentle way. <laughs> that is so excellent for winning people over instead of mine hitting them with a club, which tends to have a negative impact occasionally. Um, and of course the US campaign and all of us together, um, I think ultimately my country will join. We would prefer that the ultimately is not in another decade. It would be lovely to have them come to the third review conference in Maputo, where they will see many of us um, with some serious movement on the mine ban issue. Maybe even submitting it to the Senate, if even though now the vote would probably be difficult, it would be a nice symbol of seriousness of this uh, administration and its desire to act in 2014 before we're faced with elections again in the United States. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you for what you do related to landmines. Please gently uh, remind the US that it would be very helpful for the country to join the Mine Ban Treaty. And I hope we will be seeing as many <coughs> countries in Maputo as here. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. And next, as you know, we have the honor to have with you His Royal Highness Prince Mered Al Hussein of Jordan. I think he deserves to be uh, thanked and uh, admired for twice. Once for serving as special envoy for the Anti-Personal Mind Ban Convention since 2009, and the EU is uh, proud to support his activities, uh, but also because he comes from Jordan at a time where Jordan is particularly uh, vulnerable and uh, uh, faced with uh, uh, one of the di most direst consequences of the Syrian crisis. I think for these two reasons, we have to support him particularly. Your way, not highness. Thank you. Let me talk from the podium. That's okay. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, we have received some. Your, your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish to uh, thank uh, Human Rights Watch and the Implementation Support Unit for organizing this event, as well as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, my thanks also go to the European Union, which has not only provided the financial support to make this event possible, but is also supporting me in my efforts to, uh, as, a, as a special envoy of, uh, for Anti-Personal Mind Bank Convention for universalization. Um, for several, several years, I've traveled the world uh, promoting a cause I believe in. Uh, the aim of this cause is to end the suffering caused by anti-personnel minds. Uh, to bring a conclusive end to this suffering, we need to uh, universalize the anti-personnel mind ban convention and, in, and ensure uh, that its provisions are implemented. Um, I, like everyone in this room, I believe, uh, um, do believe that the uh, anti-personnel mind ban convention, of course, has, has been successful, has been very successful in, in many ca cases, uh, but uh, it's been successful for those party to it. Uh, what we really need is uh, it, it to be successful globally. We need the convention to be successful globally, which is important. And, and that means having all, the, all states, states that have millions of landmines stockpiled in their warehouses, states that have millions of landmines still placed in the ground, uh, states that still have um, um, 
thousands of uh, survivors that uh, need attention and need support, they also need to be on board. They need to be a part of this convention. And then, of course, countries that uh, maybe have no, no stockpiles or no mines in the ground or, uh, uh, or survivors, but uh, can very well be uh, good donors. Uh, we, need, we need them on board as well. Uh, so it, it's 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 an important, very important issue in, in my uh, my humble opinion. Uh, my task as a special envoy has uh, has seen me visit such diverse places as South Korea, uh, Tuvalu, uh, Tonga, Mongolia, um, Laos, um, Singapore, China, and and Bahrain. Uh, while I was president of the 8 MSP, uh, I also made universalization trips to uh, Poland and to Finland. Uh, and of course, in, in 2010, I, I visited the US and uh, engaged with the high level officials from the National Security Council, the State Department, and the Pentagon on the matter of the US's landmine policy review. And just, just for those of you who don't know, I mean, the whole reason for this initiative was to try to uh, engage with the, um, as high up as possible, to engage with the leaderships of, of countries that have not yet exceeded. Uh, as as you all know, I'm sure the civil society has done a tremendous uh, job right since the beginning, and there's been a lot of grassroots work. Uh, but we, th uh, as of a few years ago, we thought it would be also important to to uh, try to engage the leaderships, to engage the top as well. And so, uh, in through my visits and my uh, my um, outreach to many of the, these leaders that we visited, uh, I think we had a positive impact and in many cases the in many cases uh, my conversations with these leaders I, and I met prime ministers I've met uh, presidents vice presidents uh, uh, governor generals uh, the, in Bahrain I met with the, the crown prince of Bahrain and in many in many of these uh, visits on many of these visits it uh, actually to tell you the truth it, it was the first time that these individuals is the first time that they ever talked about landmines it had never crossed their radar screen. It was the first time. Uh, so this, uh, we, I did believe, and I still do believe, that the engagement at the high, very highest of levels is, is very, very important and crucial to our work as a whole. Um, Regarding the U.S., uh, I was extremely optimistic that this policy review would result in the U.S. being in a position to join the Ottawa Convention. After all, the U.S. shares um, our concern about the humanitarian tragedy caused by anti-personal personal mines. The U.S. has not used anti-personal mines for over two decades. Everyone, uh, every one of the U.S. Uh, U.S.'s NATO allies has forsworn the use of anti-personnel mines, and uh, the use of anti-personnel personnel mines is inconsistent with the modern, sophisticated manner in which the U.S. armed forces uh, fulfill their responsibilities. In addition to being optimistic, I was hopeful. I, I was hopeful because those whom I engaged knew full well that if President Obama adopted a policy to pr proceed with the accession to the Anti-Personnel Mind Ban Convention, it would be a manifestation of U.S. leadership. The U.S., uh, li unlike any other state, has, in a sense has the capacity to, to lead and to lead in a big way on, on this issue. Uh, a change in U.S. policy to bring it in line with the provisions of the Ottawa Convention would illustrate the, this leadership capacity in that it would have an impact on the positions of other states that remain outside of the Convention. Um, moreover, such a policy change would inject new life uh, into an effort that must still continue if we, con if we are going to succeed with the, this cause. In my humble view, again, we, we need to think uh, long term. It's not, it's not just about the U.S. joining. It's about where do we want to be in five years' time? Where do we want to be in 10 years' time? We need to have a long term view on this. What, what are the history books going to write about the anti-personal mind ban?
Un convention. And I think this is what we need to keep this in, in mind. Uh, um, the U.S. accession will, in my view, st strengthen the stamina and health of the of the convention. And it will encourage, of course, like we said, uh, um, those who have not yet joined to join, but also it will uh, give a, hopefully it will encourage uh, donors to uh, to come out of the fatigue or to con to continue uh, supporting uh, countries that very much need uh, need the support. Um, I think I don't think we can really crack open the champagne bottles yet. You know, there's still a lot a lot of work that uh, needs to be uh, done on this on this cause. Um, while it has been uh, four years since I met with uh, Samantha Power, Samantha Power, uh, as all of you know, uh, was or oh, led the charge on the policy review, as far as I understand. And uh, so I had a I had a really a great meeting with her when I was here from four years ago, and um, we talked at length about the the pros and cons of the U.S. exceeding and uh, so. Uh, I had a, I was very optimistic when I left the meeting with her, and uh, there is no good reason for the U.S. to remain outside the, of the convention, and there are many good reasons why it should should join. Uh, moreover, anything short of adopting a policy that would see the U.S. administration commit to never, under any circumstances, use, produce, stockpile, or transfer anti-personal personal mines would leave the U.S. on the sidelines and not in the lead where it normally belongs. In addition, uh, maintaining a policy that falls short of what is required to conclusively and the landmine era would seem to be inconsistent with the advanced forward-looking America that we all know and respect. My, my country, uh, Jordan, has benefited greatly from U.S. support in removing mined areas uh, from the kingdom. And we, are, we are forever grateful and indebted to the U.S. government and, and to the American people for the, their friendship and support on this particular issue. Uh, but while the U.S. has admirably invested greatly in the removal of these hidden killers, we would dearly like to see it do more to ensure that no more mines are put in the ground. Um, uh, this is a, the, the, this whole issue vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. In my my view, is it's a no-brainer. It's a, it's an easy one for the U.S. Uh, the pros far outweigh the the cons. Um, again, I, I remain optimistic, and I'm confident that the outcome of the U.S. policy review that I understand will be announced shortly will see the U.S. claim its place on the right side of history on this issue. Uh, just finally, I, I would like to say, in my, in my again, in my very humble view, um, this decision, it, it should not, it ought, it ought, maybe I have a very naive and simplistic view of the matter, but it should not be a military decision. Uh, it's it's a moral decision. It's an ethical it's an ethical decision. Uh, in many in many of the mine affected countries or the countries of party to the convention, if it were left up to the militaries to decide whether they would should join or not join, I, my guess is that many countries would not have joined. Uh, and I think very much this is in the case of my country, Jordan. If uh, if our late king had left the decision to our military, I doubt very much that we would have joined the mine ban convention because most uh, militaries, most soldiers like to hold on to their arsenals and to their toys. And so it's, it's, it's above, uh, it's not a, really a military decision. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a military decision. It's a, it's a moral decision. You know, do we want to live in a world that has these horrendous weapons that are ki killing and maiming innocent uh, uh, children and, and uh, adults uh, all over the world? And uh, 4,000 was 4,000 uh, 4, a year, I think. Now it's the the, the number of uh, victims is still a tremendous. It's a very 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 high number. I mean, they, these are st statistics. God, God alone knows if how how accurate they are. They're probably much more than that. Um, so there's still a lot of work that uh, we need to do, and having the U.S. on board would be absolutely uh, the greatest triumph because we will have, hopefully, we will have others f following suit. So. Uh, uh, we need you to tweet as much as you can and uh, write about this as much as you can, and hopefully we'll see some good change. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank you. Thank you, Prince. Uh, finally, I would... Uh, 
I have a pleasure to announce that a statement from the United States Senator Patrick Le Leahy will be read out. Senator Leahy, who could not be with us today, you know him, has long been a leader in efforts to ban antipersonal mines and as advocates in the U.S. for it uh, at, la at large. In 1992 already, he wrote, he wrote the world's first law to ban the export of these weapons, and he has led congressional efforts to create a special fund in the U.S. foreign aid budget to help landmine victims, known as the Leahy War Victims Fund. Uh, Senator Lee's statement will be read out, but Shanafa Kamsvongsha, who is executive director of Legacies of War. Maybe uh, I would just introduce a bit Shanafa Kamsvongsha. She's uh, the executive director of this organization, which seeks to address the problem of unexploded cluster bombs in Laos to provide space for healing the wounds of war and to create greater hope for a future of peace, as they define their mission. Uh, and the organization uses art, culture, education, and community work organizing to bring people together and to heal and transform out the wreckage of war. Uh, I would stop there and I will pass you the floor, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about um, our relationship with Senator Patrick Leahy, who has been um, a steadfast champion for our, our work, um, which is trying to remove unexploded ordnance in Laos and to um, help make the land safe again for its people. And, um, you know, as we all know, Senator Leahy um, has for decades and uh, every part of the world that has been ravaged by war and conflict has been the leading um, voice of conscience for uh, war victims and survivors. And so this is uh, such an honor for me to be able to um, make this um, statement on his behalf. I want to thank you, thank the European Union for sponsoring this event hosted by the U.S. Campaign to Ban Landmines and Mine Ban Treaties Implementation Support Unit. I regret that I am not able to join you. In 1994, 20 years ago, in a speech to the UN General Assembly, President Bill Clinton called for the em elimination of anti-personnel landmines. It was an historic speech that I remember as if it were yesterday. Two years later, in 1996, President Clinton said this quote, today I am launching an international effort to ban anti-personnel landmines. He went on to announce a U.S. plan to develop alternatives to landmines with the goal that the U.S. would end its use of anti-personnel mines by 2006. In 1997, the United States missed an opportunity to be a leader in the international effort to ban anti-personal mines when it refused to sign the treaty. 2006 came and went. President Clinton's administration ended. After eight years of President George W. Bush, President Obama was elected and then re-elected. In the meantime, U.S. troops fought two long ground wars without using anti-personnel landmines. In 2010, I and 67 other United States Senators sent a letter to President Obama. We commended the President for agreeing to conduct a comprehensive review of the U.S. government's policy on anti-personnel mines, and we urged him to conform U.S. policy to the Mine Ban Treaty as a crucial first step. Almost five years since the start of that review, we are still waiting for the results. After 20 years and three U.S. presidents, there is no evidence the United States is any closer to joining the treaty than when President Clinton made that speech. It is very disheartening. We all know that this is what the obstacle is. The Pentagon has long argued that it needs landmines to defend South Korea. In 1996, then Secretary of Defense William Perry said the Pentagon would, quote, move vigorously to achieve alternative ways to prevent a North Korean attack so they would no longer need landmines. Yet, after 20 years, there is no evidence they have ever done anything to revise their career war plans without anti-personal mines or that any president has ever told them to. Many believe the Pentagon's real worry is that giving up landmines, which are among a un unique category of inherently indiscriminate weapons, would encourage efforts to prohibit other weapons. There is no substance to that argument. <laughs> Some have asked what difference it would make if the U.S. joins the Mine Ban Treaty. We have not used anti-personal mines for 23 years, and we do far more to support humanitarian demining than any other country.
We have not exported anti-personnel mines since my amendment became law in 1992. We have spent many tens of millions of dollars through the Leahy War Victims Fund to aid those injured by mines. We are not causing the problem, so why bother? Because anti-personal landmines continue to kill and cripple innocent people. Because indiscriminate victim-activated weapons have no place in the arsenal of a civilized country. Because 161 nations, including most of our closest allies, have banned these weapons. And because the United States, as by far the most powerful military in the world, and this treaty needs the United States. As President Obama said in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize, quote, I am convinced that adhering to standards, international standards, strengthens those who do and isolates and weakens those who don't. 20 years after President Clinton's UN speech, President Obama can give real meaning to those words by putting the United States on a path to join the treaty. That means destroying what remains of our stockpile of mines. It means revising our career war plans. President Obama is the only one who could make that happen, and time is running out. Thank you. I think by because time is also running out here, <laughs> we are going to jump directly to the panel, if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think the opening uh, s session is closed. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your Thank kind you. words. Thank, Thank you, Your Highness. Thank you. How are you? So, how you prefer? You might want to sit here. Oh, So, just take a little of fresh one a little and just on each side of the. I'll just, I'll be right back. Why don't you go on each side and then we'll focus on the other? Okay.
Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Rachel Stoll from the Stimson Center, and um, I, along with, with our previous speakers, want to thank uh, the anti-personnel uh, mind ban convention implementation support unit that's quite a mouthful um, and human rights watch and the European Union for organizing uh, this event today I think it is very timely in advance of the uh, review conference in June but also in light of the hopefully forthcoming uh, U.S. review um, announcement. Um, given that we are short on time, I don't want to take away uh, from our very distinguished panel uh, with my own thoughts, which um, I have many. Uh, but uh, but to say that what I'd like to do in this panel is really transition from this larger discussion of the importance of the man by mine ban treaty and the the global um, impact that it has made and really narrow our focus um, onto the United States and what uh, U.S. policy has been um, and should be um, here in, in the future. Um, we, you have, uh, again, just because we're short on time, you have our panelists' uh, bios uh, in, in, the, in the program, uh, but we're very fortunate to have with us four uh, colleagues who know a lot about this subject and can speak to it from various perspectives and bring um, to our discussion really a holistic approach to um, how uh, the United States could join the Mine Ban Treaty today, um, kind of what the benefits to the United States would be, what the benefits to the rest of the world might be, and perhaps debunking some of the myths that I think continue to be perpetuated more than 15 years later as to why the United States is not party to the treaty or could not be party to the treaty. So we have with us first um, Heidi Kuhn from Roots of Peace. Uh, second, we're going to have Ken Rutherford from the Center for International Stabilization and Recovery, Steve Goose from Human Rights Watch, and General Robert Gard from the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. So we'll start with Heidi, and we'll allow um, some time for Q&A. So I have been asked to be very mindful of the time and, uh, and allow them to make some introductory remarks, and then we'll open up also for, for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much. It's my great honor to be here in the heart of my nation's capital. I come from California, and I'd like to begin my short remarks about how an idea can turn into reality in a great country such as the United States of America. Several people on this panel, General Robert Gard, Mary Wareham, Caleb Rossiter, and Jerry White, in September of 1997, came into the living room of my family home. I'm a mother of four children, and yes, a cancer survivor. Holding a child in my arm, I listened to the words of these people in Marin County. It inspired me so deeply to do something outside of myself, outside of my front door. We lifted our glasses in a toast that the world may go from mines to vines, replacing the scourge of landmines with bountiful vineyards worldwide. Today, I must proudly say that we're Roots of Peace has taken that model out of the front door of our home 17 years later to demine, replant, and rebuild worldwide. Rice in Cambodia, grapes in Afghanistan, orchards in Croatia, wheat in Iraq, and demining the Holy Lands. I can say thank you to so many people in this room for taking such courageous footsteps. To Jody Williams in September, not, September 2001, only days before the attacks in the United States of America, I walked with you in the minefields of Croatia to places not readily on the map, Vukovar, Chestamale, Chestavelica, Bibinje. We had a vision to replace the minefields with bountiful vineyards so that this country that was so beautiful on the Dalmatian coast would once again remove an estimated 1.1 million landmines and produce the bountiful vineyards that vintners such as the San Francisco Bay Area who supported us, Mienko Gergic, who founded, won the Paris Tasting in 1976, proved that the soils, the fruit that is grown on the soils of California are parallel to those in France. Yet, we proved around the world that the soils around the world, when we remove a landmine and we take the act of planting a grapevine, will produce grapes, raisins, pomegranates, and a bountiful field 
around the world. I have worked in Vietnam. Roots of Peace now has over 1,000 farmers. Oh, nearly 40 years after the war has ended, sadly, there's an estimated 3.5 million landmines long after the guns have silenced. I'm here to voice to join all those in this room who have worked for so many years. In Angola, I have taken out the landmines with the support of thousands of American children who raised 50 million American pennies for peace so that the fields where Princess Diana walked are now demined and children with three legs to stand on, two crutches, one good leg, are now playing soccer in a place called Huambo. And I must say, in Afghanistan, Roots of Peace today is $100 million under contract. And proudly as CEO, wife, and mother, I manage today in 2014 a spring like never before in a country where there is an estimated still millions of landmines in all 34 provinces. Yet Afghanistan is a country that's 80% dependent upon agriculture. And turning those swords into plowshares is the most important thing we could be talking about in this room today. I am so grateful as a proud American to my great United States of America, for I am under contract and only able to implement the, the planting of peace, the planting of the roots of peace, thanks to funding from USAID, USDA, DOD, European Union, thank you, Ambassador, uh, GTZ, and the World Bank. No idea is turned into reality without a tremendously uh, dedicated group of people as those here in this room today. And may the footsteps that we take beyond this room inspire others to join us in this effort to eradicate landmines. I'd like to conclude by saying a few weeks ago, actually, um, less than that, I'm a bit jet lagged, I was in um, the Holy Land. Today, there are an estimated 1.5 million landmines in the Holy Land today. From my humble perspective as a mother, the holy lands are not holy when there's landmines in the ground. It took eight times last year commuting from San Francisco to Tel Aviv and over, over a fence, over a border place called Ramallah. Yet with Roots of Peace and the, the funding of very incredible California vintners, we have turned mines to vines in the fields of Bethlehem. And as we anticipate the upcoming visit of Pope Francis to the Holy Land on May 24th, standing on the soils of Jordan because he cannot come in through Israel due to millions of landmines precluding the site called Qasr el Yahud, where three faiths converge, the baptismal site of Jesus Christ, where Elijah rose into heaven, the Israelites crossed over into Canaan according to the Torah, and respect for the third faith, all three faiths equally, uh, uh, Mohammed walked the Abrahamic paths. So as uh, the delegation of the Holy Father goes to Bethlehem, may we be reminded of mothers who give birth in a manger or anywhere else in the world. It takes eight pounds to detonate a landmine. It takes eight pounds to give birth to a child. May we speak today on behalf of mothers around the world who have no voice and join us in the leadership of Jody and so many others to remove these deadly seeds of hatred from our one earth. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Heidi. I think uh, you very eloquently expressed why a landmine ban is needed now, uh, perhaps more than ever, um, as we uh, as we move towards peace in so many countries around the world. Um, I want to turn to Ken to perhaps uh, reflect on, on on some of the um, benefits for the United States itself um, in joining in joining the mine ban treaty. Sorry, I'm going to stay in. I usually sit for academic presentations, and this is not one of them. Uh, uh, answer, what is it going to take for the Obama administration to accede to the Mine Ban Treaty? I hope the answer is not Norris Kids. Can Norris Kids from Morgantown, West Virginia, stand up? Can you guys stand up? <laughs> Motivating force to ban landmines in West Virginia. I hope you're not the answer. I like to propose an answer, but if we don't do it, you guys need to do it, because we're screwing it up for you guys. You guys can have a seat. 
20 years ago, I gave my first speech on landmines in 1994 at the first Senate hearing on landmines called the Global Humanitarian Mine Crisis. It was in front of the Senate Subcommittee for Foreign Operations. I didn't know anything about landmines. I received a fax, a fax, from Jody Williams introducing me to the issue after my accident in Somalia, which resulted in the loss of both of my legs. I was honored to do so because I thought it was a unique story. Unfortunately, it's not a unique story. Tens of thousands are being injured and maimed and killed every year around the world. Now 4,000 a year are killed, and that's one too many. So here we are 20 years ago, 20 years later, in Washington, D.C., and I'm getting bored of the same speeches. I'm getting bored of why our government is continually, as Jody said, to be frustrating, confusing, and mind-boggling. And as His Royal Highness just said, it's a no-brainer to sign on to this treaty. So my brief two minutes left, I say, why can't the Obama administration sign? This is the 20th anniversary of the world's first global humanitarian mine program within the U.S. government. The U.S. government has given more than $2 billion over the last 20 years to help alleviate the negative effects of landmines and other UXO. Last year, it gave $149 million in 35 countries, more than any other country combined, more if you add up the next 10 and combine it. That is a wonderful Madison Avenue PR story, yet they're not here in the room to argue for that. And my question is why, and I hope to give you the answer at the end in a minute and a half. 22 years ago, Senator Leahy, as you heard, uh, introduced legislation for the first ever in the world's history for an export, on anti export ban on anti-personal landmines. 21 years ago, in the State Department in the United States, in Washington, D.C., was the first ever comprehensive study on landmines and the humanitarian devastating effects of anti-personnel landmines called hidden killers. 20 years ago this year, President Clinton was the world's first leader to call, and I quote, for the eventual elimination of anti-personnel landmines. 18 years ago, uh, the United States led a global effort to ban anti-personnel mines. 15 years ago, President Clinton said one of his biggest disappointments as president in his administration was not signing the mine ban treaty. I'm not going to go over to the last 15 years. You already know the story. The United States was the first ever country to ban the export, first ever country to produce. Why are we here 20 years later discussing whether the United States should join or not, especially when the U.S. is doing so much to try to alleviate the negative effects? Among several issues, which General Guard, I'm sure, will talk about, and Steve Goose, two sticking issues are special forces and SEALs, and the second is the Korean forces under U.S. command in time of war in Korea. Both of those distinguished individuals will address those arguments. However, I point to His Royal Highness, Prince Mered, and his beautiful, wonderful kingdom of Jordan. They are surrounded by not-so-peaceful states, let's say. They are a major contributor to United Nations peacekeeping operations. They have very well-respected special forces, including King Abdullah. Yet, they overcame their own arguments and showed the courage to sign and ban anti-personal landmines. And if the Kingdom of Jordan can do it, why can't we? In my opinion, there's been enough information and options presented to President Obama. So here's my elevator speech, bottom line answer to my question, which I posed at the beginning of my short presentation. President Obama simply needs the political courage to say, yes, we can, as he did six years ago, and to accede to the mind ban treaty in a positive way. We're asking him to beat a change, but the United States has been a change in a number of issues in anti-personnel minds. I asked President Obama, if not who, if not you, who? If you're not going to take Leo's leadership to accede to the treaty, then who? Is it the students from Morgantown? Probably. I hope not. I would ask President Obama to send a, an official representative to Maputo in 2014 in June and announce that he's going to support the exceeding of the United States 
to the mind ban treaty because after all, it's a very easy question that should not be frustrating, confusing, mind boggling, and it's a no brainer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. I think we're all a little less confused. And, um, so I think that was a nice transition, actually, to, to Steve Goose to perhaps debunk some of the, uh, the myths that are being uh, perpetuated um, on this issue, why the United States can't sign, and, and what is necessary for, for the US to sign. Thanks very much, Rachel. And, and thanks to um, the first keynote speakers and to the panel, really uh, great job. Uh, for all of you. I mean, Prince Mered put it, I think, uh, very eloquently. Essentially, essentially, there are no good reasons for not joining the Mine Ban Treaty for the U.S., and an awful lot of compelling reasons why it should, in terms of benefits to the U.S., benefits to the treaty, benefits to international security, and benefits to the victims uh, around the world. There have been a whole series of excuses that have been given over the years for why the U.S. can't join. Perhaps the one that's heard more often than anything else is Korea. Uh, and particularly uh, back in 1997, at the time of the negotiations and immediately afterwards, um, the, the threat of a North Korean invasion, what had to be done to stop that was what was cited most frequently. My own view, and I think that of many others, is that Korea is cited most often because it's the easiest sell. It's the thing that frightens people the most, frightens the public the most, frightens the people on Capitol Hill the most, uh, in terms of um, convincing them that landmines are still needed for some security purpose. But in fact, there may be no place on Earth where the lowly anti-personnel landmine is needed less than on the Korean Peninsula. Because there is nowhere on Earth that um, the potential of an invasion has been thought through, and where there are so many systems, and redundant systems, and redundant systems on top of redundant systems, that are designed precisely to fulfill the kind of missions that anti-personnel mines traditionally in the past have played, in terms of early warning or slowing down an attack, creating fear. These things can all be accomplished in many, many ways. And there are lots of in-place forces and systems and equipment that are designed to do that on the Korean Peninsula. It is not an anti-personnel mine that is going to determine the success or failure of any aggression uh, from North Korea. And the war plan calls for taking the attack to the north in any event. Um, so that is not really the way it's going to work out. We have had for many years, uh, especially going back in, in the mid-1990s, we had several of the former commanders of US forces in Korea, the top dogs, say that anti-personnel mines were not and are not an important part of war plans um, on the Korean Peninsula. Said very directly and very clearly that this was not something that they ever thought about as being a crucial part of any potential battle uh, in North Korea. But it plays well. So we still continue to hear it from time to time. It's been our understanding that during the course of this review, which is now dragged on into its fifth year, um, the idea of Korea being a sticking point because of the need for anti-personnel mines, there has become less and less uh, important, um, realizing that there are lots of other ways to fight. Also, people should realize, we haven't talked about it, I mean, the U.S. has already banned the use of what most people think of as anti-personnel mines, the ones you stick in the ground uh, and walk away from. The U.S. has banned the use of those weapons since 2011 in, in Korea and everywhere else in the world. Uh, so that's not what they, what they are thinking about. They do have in mind uh, potentially using other types of anti-personnel mines, remotely delivered ones, which I'll get to in a second. But um, the notion of needing to you know, plant lots of landmines to slow down uh, troops walking along the, the roads uh, just isn't the, isn't the case anymore. And the mines that are in the DMZ already are not US mines, wouldn't have to be dealt with if the US were to join this treaty. Those belong to the South Koreans uh, legally. 
But they have raised the issue of what to do about the joint command structure. When war comes to the Korean Peninsula, as things stand now, South Korean forces technically become under the command of a US general. Uh, and if the US were to join the convention, that would create difficulties in terms of South Koreans wanting to use anti-personnel mines and a US general not being able to order uh, the use uh, of those mines. But that command structure has been um, under review for a long time and indeed was slated several years ago to um, change over and put the South Koreans in charge of their own forces in wartime. That has been delayed now uh, several times and uh, probably will remain open for a while, but it's already been agreed by US and South Korea that this is where you should go with the command structure. So that shouldn't be an obstacle either. Though Korea really um, will not be a compelling uh, reason not to join, although it would not surprise me if the review goes the wrong way. That's the first thing they cite. Um, the other reason that is often cited is the desire of the military to continue to have the option to use so-called smart mines. The dumb mines are the ones you put in the ground. Smart mines are the ones that are dropped out of aircraft or fired out of artillery or rocket systems, oftentimes by the, the hundreds or, or thousands, that scatter out uh, over a very wide area, throw out tripwires uh, that um, then would blow up when people uh, would or come along at a later point, of, point in time. The US, during the negotiations, tried to get an exception for these smart minds, arguing that they are not dangerous, that they don't pose the same kind of dangers as dumb minds. Uh, the U.S. sent a team of generals uh, to, uh, to uh, Oslo during the negotiations to try and convince all of their closest military allies that smart minds were different and did not need to be banned. They were rebuffed by their closest military allies who um, listened to the arguments that these anti-personnel minds are also indiscriminate, uh, also would have high failure rates, and would pose unacceptable dangers to civilians. That is still the case today. We've heard that, there, uh, that there's a need for alternatives to be developed before the US can join the mine ban treaty. Well, the US has not spent any real efforts trying to develop those alternatives. And so this has been sort of a hollow uh, uh, rationale that has been put forth. But the truth is the US has found the alternatives. It has fought an awful lot of wars and battles over the course of the past 23 years and hasn't had to use anti-personnel mines. That sounds like they found an alternative to me. <laughs> other existing weapons, other tactics, other ways of carrying out your missions have been found and have been found in all kinds of different settings. High intensity conflict, low intensity conflict in many different regions and, and, and areas. The true reason why the US hasn't joined, I think, goes back to the fact that it wasn't part of the leadership on this during the negotiations and doesn't like to come in after the fact. It doesn't like this notion of the slippery slope uh, that uh, Senator Leahy referred to, which is the fear that if you give up anti-personnel mines, you'll then have to give up something else, I don't know, cluster bombs uh, or, or other things. Um, and uh, this is something that they probably should be worried about. Um, we were very focused on landmines uh, at, at the time of the negotiations, uh, and indeed now we do look at other weapon systems that have uh, the same kind of negative humanitarian impact. But because you're afraid of, because you, you don't want to give up one system that crosses the line in terms of dangers to civilians doesn't mean you should then move on to the next one. Um, so in, in the end, that is really a counterproductive argument as well. Uh, I'll wrap up here. I think I'm getting the eyeball a little bit. Um, in my view, the, the, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is the US will never use anti-personnel landmines again. It will be politically impossible for it to do so. Uh, it, it has uh, uh, nearly all of its 
military allies are on board the convention yet. Every other NATO member is on board. Other big allies like um, Australia and Japan, uh, the countries where it's been fighting wars are already on board the treaty, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it will be, I think, politically impossible for the U.S. to do it. So it really is, shows a, a, a kind of weakness of leadership that they haven't been able to come on board after all these years and with uh, all the positive developments that have happened as a result uh, of the treaty. So indeed, it is time for them to jump on board this as a humanitarian imperative, not a military decision, but a moral one, as Prince Mered said uh, so eloquently. Uh, and the time to do that is, is now. This review is about to wrap up possibly any day, certainly uh, any week now, it seems. And um, it may be uh, the last chance before another generation comes along to make sure the right thing is done. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And, and before we turn it or open it to questions, I want to give General Guard an opportunity also to make some remarks about the, the logic of the U.S. position and potential uh, movement forward in the future. Yeah, some mean short, and uh, <laughs> I'll try to make it that way. The, the prince rightly observed that this is a moral and humanitarian issue. I believe it's also a legal issue. We in the United States claim we are a nation that subscribes to the rule of law. And I was going to spend the first few minutes proving to you that we're violating the law, but I'm going to skip that because it's probably less important than the moral and humanitarian issues. Um, I got into the business of the international campaign quite by happenstance. Uh, I received a letter out of the blue while I was in uh, Monterey, California, asking me to sign an open letter to the president that we're trying to get senior retired military officers to say that the mines were not necessary militarily. And I chucked it aside. Uh, I'd been retired from the military then. This was 1996. I'd already been retired 15 years. I didn't know much about what had happened to landmines. But I got to thinking, I never let my troops use them, either in the Korean War, yes, I'm that old, uh, or in the Vietnam War. So I agreed to sign on to the letter. Bingo! Phone call from somebody named Bobby Muller, who I'd never heard of, uh, who ran the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, which I had never heard of. And he said, I want to fly you to Washington. Uh, I have a table at a fundraiser at the White House. We're going to be able to confront the president on this issue. And uh, being uh, somewhat impulsive, going through the receiving line, I didn't say, good evening, Mr. President, because Bobby said we'd talk to him later. I said, Mr. President, you ought to ban the use of anti-personnel landmines. And he was taken aback. We did talk to him later, and he said to me, and uh, I was somewhat taken aback by this, he said, well, you know, I can't risk a breach with the Joint Chiefs. Well, he's a commander in chief. But you may recall that in the lead up to uh, President Clinton's first election, there was some controversy about his position regarding the United States military. And he came in uh, faced with a suspicious institution. And I suspect that was the reason why he felt he uh, didn't want to cross the Joint Chiefs at that point. Which, which leads me to the point Steve uh, made about the reasons the military oppose giving up their landmines. And I think the slippery slope is the principal reason. And as he rightly pointed out, uh, sure enough, we're after some other weapons, but we're after them anyway, whether they sign the land bond treaty or not. And the other reason that hasn't been mentioned is what the economists call sunk costs. We spent a lot of money on those anti-personnel and mixed uh, systems. So someday they might come in handy. 
so we don't want to give them up. Well, uh, as has been noted, the U.S. last employed self-destruct mines uh, during Gulf I, 1990-91, to eject Iraqi forces from Kuwait. And I would suggest to you there's a military reason for not employing anti-personnel landmines. Because they impeded the maneuverability of our own forces during that conflict and slowed their operational tempo. During the offensive operation, the 18th Corps sent a message to all units noting that several severe injuries had resulted to allied soldiers and warning that extreme caution must be exercised in moving and maneuvering through areas where our airstrikes had been conducted because these airstrikes, as, as Steve pointed out, uh, dropped these scatterables and we didn't know where they all were and the, the ground forces overran them and we inflicted casualties on our own troops. In its after action report, the 1st Infantry Division expressed grave concern, and I'm quoting, about minefields created by U.S. weapons and noted that, quote, casualties would have been even higher had there been a requirement for a dismounted assault, meaning they had to get out of their armored personnel carriers, uh, when foot troops, of course, are highly vulnerable to anti-personnel landmines. Uh, that may help explain why the U.S. has not employed these mines since Gulf I, because you kill your own troops with them, which is one of the main reasons why I didn't let my troops use them, because you forget where they are. Oh, you're supposed to map them, and if you move, you're supposed to go in and pick them all up and take them out. Do you think that happens in, in the rush of combat operations? Of course not. Now, the Gulf War also demonstrated the fallacy of the self-destruct claim. Mistakes in airspeed, drop height, fuse settings add to the failure rate of the arming mechanisms combined with failures of the self-destruct mechanism, resulting in residual unexploded mines in an unknown condition that require treating them just as the armed and dangerous mines. CMS Environmental Inc., the U.S. contractor employed to clear mines from one of the four sectors of Kuwait following the Gulf War, had to deal with 1,700 smart mines that were still present on the battlefield. And I was told by a British colleague whose name I'm blocking since deceased, who conducted uh, uh, the demining in another sector of Kuwait that he had a similar experience. Fifteen years ago, while part of the VVF's international campaign to ban landmines, I wrote a monograph entitled Alternatives to Anti-Personnel Landmines. I just want to underscore uh, what Steve Goose said. I explained each of the functions that mines are purported to perform and pointed out ways to meet these requirements by other means less dangerous to our own troops and to innocent civilians. I did, by the way, provide a copy of that old antiquated pamphlet uh, to the Department of State team that presumably was reviewing the U.S. position on the Ottawa Treaty fairly early on in President uh, Obama's term, first term. I'd like to conclude by underscoring also what Steve said about Korea. I was stunned uh, when I heard that Patrick Leahy said we needed, uh, in the statement that was read to us, uh, that we needed a change in the war plan in Korea. 
It may have slipped his mind, but he personally arranged for me to, to go to South Korea. It must have been 13, 14 years ago to take a look at the situation on the ground, to get a briefing. I went and they took me up through the military control zone of eight kilometers, the two kilometer demilitarized zone to the observation post. And Steve, you're absolutely right. Boy, is that a sales job. And the hordes of North Korean troops rushing through the passes from North Korea into the south, overwhelming the US forces on the front lines could be stopped only by anti-personnel landmines combined with anti-tank landmines. Well, when I got a briefing uh, back at the headquarters, it was an unclassified briefing. I wasn't even cleared for rumor at that point. <laughs> but they, they revealed to me, and probably shouldn't have, that the US troops weren't going to be defending part of the DMZ. The war plan called for them to pull back as a mobile reserve as soon as the conflict was imminent, meaning that if there was a penetration, they would be there to uh, counter that penetration as a mobile force. Well, a war plan also called, when conflict was imminent, to take a whole bunch more mines and run, up at, run them up into the military control zone, stick them into holes that were already dug. Well, I asked the briefing officer, I said, are you aware that a whole bunch of civilians have moved up there now and are farming that land? Well. Yes. I said, what do, you, do you think trucks are going to be able to use the roads when war is imminent and the civilians who are living up there get wind of it? You're going to have mobs of civilians using the roads to pull back just as they did in the Korean War in which I participated. Well, he said, we hadn't thought of that. But even if they do somehow get trucks up there and put more mines in the holes that are in the ground, um, this doesn't prevent the United States from signing the mine ban treaty because these are now Korean mines. The ones in the ground, as Steve said, quite rightly, they were already Korean mines when I was over there uh, getting that briefing. We managed to work with our NATO allies, all of whom have agreed to sign the treaty uh, without any particular difficulty. So if South Korea feels they need to keep those mines in place, uh, we can work with them, just as we work with our, or as our NATO allies work with us, because we haven't signed the treaty. Well, uh, let me conclude uh, on that note to leave time for questions and comments. Thank you, General Guard. I think your firsthand experience um, in, in Korea and elsewhere were really helpful to put some of these arguments um, that we can all make and find logic in really into context and, uh, and, and make them even more powerful. I do want to um, open the floor to some questions. I think I will give our distinguished guest, Prince Mered, the first question. But if you, I'm not sure, are there mic? Yes, there are mics in the back of the room, so if you um, come up to the front, and then if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Thank you. I just want to thank all the panelists for the presentations, and I just have a, just a simple question. Where do we go from here? What's the, once we leave the room, this room today, what, what's step number two? Thank you. Well, as I, as I noted briefly, um, the time for affecting the outcome of the review uh, may be very, very limited. Um, 
it's our understanding that it has moved way up the food chain and indeed may even be on the president's desk. Um, we don't know. We don't know for sure, and we get conflicting reports about exactly where things stand and exactly what the outcome might be of this review. Um, to the degree that there can still be an impact on the review itself, it would have to be at the highest level. Um, and uh, it's unlikely that there could be, I think, significant change in whatever has, has gone forward uh, from this point. It's probably an options paper that's been sent up, meaning that uh, choices can be made against options that are maybe better and worse from our perspectives. Um, so, uh, but, but again, most of the real work on this was done back in, in 2010. And it's been delayed largely, I think, to lack of prioritization and will. Um, what we can try and do, I think, is things like this event and other things to raise awareness in the coming days and weeks about the importance of this issue uh, to the American public, public and uh, to the Congress and to the international community more uh, widely uh, in order to try and encourage them to select the best of the options that may be there, uh, or at least to uh, refine them in such a way that they um, reflect some, at least some movement toward the mind ban treaty. You know, I mean, the objective, you know, our ultimate objective is that the U.S. does join the treaty. That would require the Senate submission to the Senate and its advice and consent. Um, that could be a long slog. Uh, and as Jody talked about it in, in her remarks, there are a lot of things that can be done immediately. Uh, and we're hoping that this review will identify some of those things that can be done immediately, including a, 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 a call for the halt to use of the weapon. You don't have to sign the treaty to stop using the weapon, to prohibit the use of the weapon. They haven't been using it for more than two decades, but to um, make it explicit that they won't be used again and to start destroying the stocks. Uh, we understand as part of the review, uh, a plan for stockpile destruction has been drawn up. They figured out what it would cost and how long it would take and if they could meet the deadlines uh, of the treaty, uh, which they can. Um, and uh, yeah, so we may not have much time for having influence, but that's, that's the, the immediate thing. And then the question will be, how do we react? And what are our options once they tell us what they want to do? I don't think I need it in the mic. But, um, oh, um, I just, your forbearance on this ignorance, but maybe as our respective organizations go out to try to uh, interface with the American public, I may need a bit of a civic lesson because I'm kind of confused here. The parallel process between what happens on the UN level and on the US level, if it's the difference between what the president can do and the Senate has to do, there were remarks about President Clinton could have signed the treaty, but Obama has to potentially wait for the Senate to take the, uh, a little. Is that because of the stage the treaty was in? Or could you just give a little bit of a civic lesson on how we should be lobbying our constituents and, and all of that? Well, the, with regard to signing, once the treaty entered into force, I mean, the, the treaty opened for signature in December of 1997. And um, once there were 20 countries that ratified it, uh, it entered into force uh, six months later. Uh, that happened in uh, 1998, March of 1998. Um, and once the treaty entered into force, a country can no longer sign it. They have to do what's called accede to it. And accession is essentially a, a one-step process that involves both sort of signature and ratification, uh, what most people call ratification, which is what the Senate would have to do with it. Um, so you can't just sign now and, and, and wait around years to ratify while your legislature works its way through it. Um, but what you can do is commit to it and put in place this, this, the same steps that you would follow if indeed you had signed it. Um, but you cannot, uh, cannot go through that process anymore. Well, hey, Steve, if, uh, as I understand it, the Treaty on Treaties says if you sign a treaty, then you are obligated to comply with its provisions whether or not you have ratified it. So it seems to me, uh, maybe I need the civics lesson, but it seems to me it'd be worth it to get it signed because it would commit us to complying even though 
we formally would not be a member of the treaty. You, you, you can't sign it. It's not open for signature any longer. That, that you can't do that. There's can't do it. No. That you sign. Hmm. The yeah. book is closed. <laughs> so, do we have other questions? Other questions? I can say something. Uh, small thing. We need to push it. We've got to push this with the international public health problem. People say we don't use landmines, it's not a problem. Many countries use landmines, and we're the excuse they're using them. We saw that in Georgia. As the United States needs them, the best army in the world, we need them too. I heard that over and over again. So it's us stopping other countries from using them is the crucial reason behind this. Could I also ask when, when people ask questions just to introduce yourself? Because um, I think your perspective is useful. Excuse me, Jim Kobe, I'm a surgeon and do public health. Yeah, thank you and a very long time supporter of the campaign. Been around from the beginning, doing uh, incredible work for Physicians for Human Rights and others. I think I, okay. Hi, good morning, I'm Jeff Abramson with the Landmine and Cluster Munition Monitor. Um, we have a unique gathering here today in the sense that we have a very international gathering. We have a lot of diplomats here as well. Um, you know, a lot of us meet you in Geneva at meetings, but what do you think can be done here at the diplomatic level in Washington, D.C., as part of that, that message to this administration to make the right decision on that option? Could possibly ask uh, Prince Moret to, to answer what, uh, what can be done to, to help uh, others move along. We have, over the years, um, over the course of the past 15 plus years, uh, and particularly over the course of the duration of this review, um, reached out extensively to the diplomatic community here in Washington and around the world, especially to the state's parties uh, to the Mine Ban Treaty, to um, let the Obama administration know uh, their views on how important it is for the US to join, that it still would matter to the state's parties uh, that the US joined. Uh, because there, there had emerged something of a malaise where people were saying, we're essentially complying with the treaty, why do you really care? And they needed to hear, I think, from a large number of states that indeed uh, it's still seen as very important uh, and that it would have benefits to the U.S. and benefits to the treaty and benefits to the international community for the U.S. to come on board. Uh, it's our understanding that a lot, of, a lot of states' parties did reach out to the U.S. Uh, and that uh, in the course of the review, uh, they consulted with uh, any number of some of the leading states' parties. So hopefully that has had some impact and will have some impact, um, but um, it's never too late uh, to, to make a, another push uh, to try and, and uh, convince the U.S. that this is a really important thing for it to do and to do it soon. Well, I'm an optimist. I've been in this business for 17 years, but I draw back to uh, the call to action for the young people and the international diplomats in this room uh, that now today we have the tools of social media at our hands, at our fingertips as we speak. And uh, I believe now is the time for peace. It is the peace process. And whatever anyone can do in this room, tell 10 friends. I have my team back in the San Francisco Bay Area, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, Twitter. Let's, let's get this going. This is serious. I, uh, I don't want to be here bored, you know? I, I mean, I flew out the red eye. I mean, I'm here. It's, you know, and again, as a heart of a mother, I mean, this is beyond moral. This is, this is peace at ground zero. And to, to remove these seeds of hatred from our one earth right now, and to literally get down on our knees and plant the roots of peace, it would be such a leadership opportunity to my great country. Again, thank you. Thank you, America, for uh, $2.2 billion you contributed to mine action. Let's hope today it's only a beginning. Thank you, Heidi. I think we had someone in the back. Hi. Uh I'm Chris Johnson from upstairs in the Secure World Foundation. I saw the flyer in the hallway, and it looked interesting, so I thought I'd pop it. <laughs> um, the flyer says that there's 160 member states to the treaty, including the, European, uh, the entire European Union and all of sub-Saharan Africa. So my question is, at what point does this treaty uh, pass into the realm of customary international law? The US would be a possibly persistent objector. At what point does it then maybe pass into the realm of use Kogans? We couldn't claim persistent objector status. 
if there's a pen. I don't pen know how many lawyers there are in the room, but I'm sure you'd have as many answers to that question, different answers to that question as you have number of international lawyers uh, in the room. Um, we still tend to talk in the campaign about uh, continuing to build and strengthen the international norm against these weapons. Uh, the ICRC in, in its commentary a few years back uh, did not take the view that this had yet entered into the realm of customary international law, uh, in no small part because there are still some major countries outside of it, uh, some who reserve the right to produce uh, and use the weapon, such as the US, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, um, and, and, and a few others. But it's, it is quite clear that we are building toward this norm all the time as we continue to universalize uh, the treaty itself, and perhaps more importantly, universalize the norm, the, the standard that it is setting. Um, because we see around the world, uh, most of the countries that are not part of the treaty are complying with its basic provisions. Um, in recent years, you usually only see one or two countries, governments per year, use the weapon. Use has fallen off almost altogether. Syria has been using. Uh, Libya used before that uh, under Gaddafi uh, during those conflicts. Uh, usually the, the, the Burmese government uh, continues to lay mines each year, but that's about it. Uh, you don't see other countries using. And the stigmatization against the weapon has been extremely effective uh, around the globe, so that even those who are not part of the treaty um, largely act like they're part of the treaty. So the norm is building. Um, uh, international lawyers probably still take the view that it, it, it has not yet reached the status of customary law, which most of you may know then becomes binding on all countries, whether you've signed a treaty or ratified it or not. If it's customary law, it's binding on everybody. We treat it like it is. Uh, we condemn any use of anti-personal minds by anybody, anywhere, government forces, rebel forces, whether they've joined the treaty or not, uh, because that's how you stigmatize the weapon and how you do build the norm. Uh, thank you. I'm Michael Moore. I'm with Landmines in Africa. Um, my question is about, you mentioned non-state actors, and I'm curious how you think that the, if the U.S. were to accede to the Mine Ban Treaty, how that would affect use by non-state actors and not just in other states. I'm happy to keep talking, but I'm also happy to, to, to jump in any time. Um, Use by non-state actors has also been decreasing uh, since the, the birth of the treaty, and there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of non-state armed groups who have pledged one way or another uh, to uh, never again use anti-personnel mines. Um, and so we've had success along those lines. We see, uh, in, in general, a, a fairly steady decrease in the number of countries and number of non-state armed groups using the weapon. The US joining, I think, by, by again, helping, helping to further stigmatize the weapon and further strengthen the norm will have uh, an additional impact uh, on the uh, non-state groups as well. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, the US will, uh, you know, would, would undoubtedly bring a few countries along with it right away. I, I doubt that the next day Russia and China and India and Pakistan would, would, would come on board. But I think they would be affected by the U.S. joining. I think they would be much less likely, for example, to use the weapon in the future if the U.S. were on board and, and knew that they were going to be criticized um, by the U.S. as well as others. So it would have, I think, a, an across-the-board impact on, on recalcitrant, recalcitrant states as well as on the non-state actors. Thank you. I'd just like to make a Another comment, or uh, I, I agree very much with Steve what you said about prioritization and uh, uh, Heidi also about regarding the media. And uh, you know, sometimes I think uh, the, the mind ban community were so engrossed in the issue, we think that everyone else is thinking about it as well. <laughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, is that most leaders around the world, maybe very, 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 very rarely have they ever thought about this issue. Or if they have discussed it, they've maybe discussed it once or maximum twice, you know. So um, 
<laughs> that's where the media plays an important part. You know, there's so many competing uh, competing uh, priorities and issues. Um, I give you a little example. I mean, Kerry and I had uh, had the pleasure of visiting uh, very small countries in the Pacific, and we visited uh, Tonga a few years ago, and we had a great meeting with the uh, Prime Minister of Tonga. And, uh, and Tonga, as you know, I think you know, it's a very, very small island with only 10,000 popula 10 population, 10,000, 20,000. And so Kerry and I came out of the meeting think th thinking it was a slam dunk uh, uh, that, you know, here we had succeeded in convincing the prime minister. And, and the prime minister was very, very, very positive on, on the issue. And then we had a meeting with the um, minister of justice. And uh, so we thought, oh, done deal. You know, we're going, this is terrific. but. Here we are a few years later, and Tonga did not accede uh, to, uh, to the convention. So this is a very small country where there are other competing issues as well, from healthcare, uh, education, yeah, you name it. So I, I don't want to uh, defend the US administration on this, but I'm, I'm sure you know when it comes to priorities also, it's just the, 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 the intentions of the US administration, I'm sure, I, my belief is that they are noble and want, we do want to maybe move in that direction, but there are just so many other issues on, on, the, on the horizon. You know? so, so this is where it's so key that the media plays an, an important part to, to make, it, make the landmine issue important. I mean, in my, in my case, in my, in, in regarding Jordan, uh, in, in the past, I, a lot of people used to ask me, you know, well, why, why, why does Jordan care about the landmine issue when we only have a handful of people injured, uh, injured a year? And people would ask me, why don't, why don't you spend your time uh, working on uh, traffic uh, accidents? And we have thousands of people are killed and injured every year from traffic accidents. And only a very small am amount of people now, thank God, no, uh, no, uh, uh, no accidents. But as of a few years ago, we did have a small am amount, a few, very few every year. So my, my, my answer to that was that, that uh, we should work on both. It's not one or the other. I mean, of course, we need to work on traffic accidents and make sure that people, uh, you know, don't uh, drive uh, uh, in, a, in a proper way, but but also we need to work on this issue. So it's this question of priorities and uh, and ke keeping keeping the media attention. You know, sometimes I think if uh, the late uh, Princess Diana did not pass away and she continued to work on this issue, things would be very very different now because uh, the media does play a very very important role. So thank you. So just to follow uh, Prince Mered's remarks, um, it's a question of priorities, but I'd like to maybe change the conversation a little bit and talk about vision. And one of the reasons Jordan banned landmines was the vision of His Late Majesty King Hussein, who had a broader vision on peace. And it comes down to President Obama making a decision, bottom line. Nelson Mandela, when he became president of South Africa, he was horrified at the deadly legacy that his country left in the most mine-infected region of the most mine-infected continent, Southern Africa, with all the landmines in Mozambique, Angola, left by the South. He made a decision in 1997, I believe it was February, to ban landmines, the production, the largest producer in the, African in the African continent. The year before, a political scientist became um, a foreign minister of Canada. Lloyd Axworthy, who redefined security in a different way. It's not guns, it's not artillery, it's human security. Bruise over people's heads, um, food in their stomachs. It takes, it's, it's the idea of a vision and not looking back. And I just think it's ultimately ironic that the change president is looking back and not looking forward. I'd also like to thank the Prince for his continued leadership from the, the uh, from Jordan. Uh, we need to be talking, I think, about the economics of peace. It's not just something as Jody, you know, we know up here, but we need to ground it. We need to bring it down to earth, remove these landmines and, and, and replace them with shovels so people can get back to the earth. The economics of peace do to create great vision and uh, it requires imagination. Uh, the Prince had mentioned, uh, this is in his very humble opinion, a no-brainer. Um, I'd like to build upon that. I'd say it's a Mickey. <laughs> now let me tell you why, because in uh, Afghanistan, again after the world stopped shortly after Jody and I came back, uh, 
from Croatia, everyone felt a little bit of America in their heart. And one of the most generous donors that I'd like to thank who is no longer here in this room uh, today or on this earth is Diane Disney Miller, who gave me the funding when I told her we can turn mines to vines in the country of Afghanistan. The grapes that America enjoys today actually emanated from Afghanistan, 4,000 varietals of grapes at UC Davis. Roots of Peace was able to go in there and, and raise the funding from uh, Diane personally. We hired the Halo Trust. We demined the Shamali Plains north of Kabul, which was uh, uh, sown with seeds of hatred of landmines, not only by the Soviets, but by the Taliban. It was the most wicked place that you could see these grapevines, you know, just uh, burned literally to the ground. And I just would like to say when you can turn that vision into reality, to have stood on that minefield, former minefield, this past August, and uh, anybody who'd like to see and not, you know, the trellis grapevines with the women farmers growing from the former minefield. It was literally mines to vines. And of course, with deepest respect to the Muslim culture, no grape will ever be fermented with due respect to their religion. But it's the seeds we have in common as opposed to those which separate us. I know how important Afghanistan is to our to our dear President Obama as we speak. But let's, let's accelerate this. Let's get more land that is not held hostage by landmines. An average Afghan farmer growing a low value crop such as wheat will make $800 a year. $1,200 growing poppies and trellis grapevines through the efforts of Roots of Peace and over 1 million Afghan farmers and families will reap a profit of three to $4,000 a year. Let's put these farmers back to earth all around the world on former minefields now. Thank you. Perhaps with those inspirational words um, before Mary continues to give me the, the evil eye, um, I, I would like to thank our, our panelists. Um, I know they will be here through the end of the program, so if there are additional questions, I know we didn't get to yours. Um, they will be willing to, to speak uh, with you after the event. But I do want to thank them for um, bringing to, to bear an issue that does need awareness raised, that it, yes, it's 15 years uh, since the treaty entered into force, and, and it's a wonderful thing, and there's been a lot of progress, but there's still much more work to be done. And I hope not only have we raised the profile today, but perhaps we've pushed the president with a little more courage to, to do the right thing um, as we approach the release of this review. So thank you very much. Will you take me to a minefield somewhere? Hmm? Would you accompany me to a minefield somewhere? Okay. Could we go? To quick, a quick let's, technical break. Let's, yeah, let's, we'll let's just take a technical break for a couple of minutes yeah, here and let our panelists uh, come down. And uh, I'd like to invite Beth up here from Handicap International. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Good work. So I think that's been really helpful. So got the ambassador. Where is she going? <laughs> Can you see her? Oh, there she is. Okay. Okay. So. Can you tell me when you want to get down? I've got three words to say. And I'm going to go sit down there and we're yeah okay we just have one final speaker with us this morning and to introduce her uh, I would like to introduce Beth McNan who's the uh, executive director of Handicap International USA so after this speaker will conclude the event uh, we should be finished uh, in the next 10 minutes by 11.30, and then we can continue having refreshments, etc. So, uh, if everybody's ready, I'm going to introduce uh, Beth now to introduce the final speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to Mozambique. 
The woman de minor who is on the cover of today's program, Sarnetta, comes from Mozambique. And we all know that 2014 will be a very important year for Mozambique. De minors like Sarnetta will help celebrate the country's liberation from the scourge of landmines. 2014 is also the year that all of us return to Maputo. The international community met there to begin implementing the Mine Ban Convention in 1999, and in June we will reconvene for the third review conference of the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention. Her Excellency Ambassador Amelia Sombana has served as Mozambique's distinguished representative to the United States since 2009. Previously, she served her country as a parliamentarian and during that time was the secretary of the Central Committee of International Relations of the Frelimo Party. She was also a founding member of Mozambique's Red Cross. Today, she brings us a voice from Mozambique, the voice of Enrique Banze, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mozambique and the President-designate of the Third Review Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Handicap International and the U.S. Campaign to Ban Landmines, it is my privilege to introduce to you Her Excellency Ambassador Sambana. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present uh, Mozambique. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here in this very important gathering. As it was said, it's a very important year for Mozambique. We are part of uh, uh, this convention, and uh, we are glad that uh, Mozambique is going to host this year, um, the, this coming conference in June. Uh, I'm addressing this gathering on behalf of the President-designate of the Third Review Conference on Anti-Personal Mining, Mr. Banze, who is the Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation in Mozambique. Allow me to commend the organizers of this event, the Implementation Support Unit, the Human Rights Watch, as well as the support from the European, uh, European Union for this timely event. I'm not for forgetting uh, your Royal Highness, the Prince, Marriott of Jordan, and the comment the efforts of your country. As we are heading towards the end of our meeting, which had been a very instructive and very useful meeting, it gives me pleasure to note that throughout the discussions all this morning, we entertained this morning there was a growing consensus around the fact that uh, the United States of America is a serious and strong partner when it comes to instilled deeds leading to join the international efforts to ban the surge of landmines. The consensus, too, included the hope that the U.S. will seize this momentum to take bold steps to join the convention and come to Maputo ready to become a full member. In fact, the United States of America has shown great generosity in contributing to the mining efforts around the world, including in Mozambique. Thanks to the assistance from the US and other countries in America and the other parts of the world, in Europe, uh, we are very grateful Mozambique is now fortunately on the verge of addressing its landmine challenge. We therefore believe that in addition to its continued commitment, the United States would hopefully lend its unprecedented leadership to this cause in a bid to meet our expectations of eliminating the personal mines once and for all. For, we, for what we count on its universal acceptance of anti-personal mind ban convention 
and full compliance with its provisions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Maputo Review Conference will be the third opportunity for the international community to gather at a high level to review the efforts to end the suffering caused by antipersonal mines. The venue of the conference is quite significant. Mozambique symbolizes well the current stage and peculiar time in the, in the life of the convention for many reasons, particularly the following. In the early 1990s, Mozambique was one of the countries where the tragedy caused by antipersonal mines was one of the greatest, and coincidentally, one of the birthplaces of the anti-land mines movement. When the convention was adopted, the clearance of all mined areas was quite a myriad. Fortunate enough, by the time of the Maputo Review Conference, all that will all that will remain in Mozambique will be specific challenges along its border with Zimbabwe, which will also be cleared the sooner than later. Therefore, for us, the Maputo Review Conference generates hope to those still addressing the line mine challenge and restores confidence that an end is still is within sight. Again, soon after the convention's entry into force, Mozambique hosted and presided over the first meeting of the state's parts in, in May 1999. So returning to Maputo 15 years later for the Maputo Review Conference, the world will return to where international efforts to implement it all began. For those who don't know, let me say that in May 1999, there were, about, there were but 45, 45 parties to the convention, and Mozambique was only one of the 18 states in Africa that had committed to this movement. Now, there are around 161 states bound by this convention. And we are proud to note that it is virtually universalized in Africa. Today, the use of landmines is understood by both world leaders and ordinary citizens that is an unacceptable behavior in the modern world that goes along with the norms embodied by the convention. Some years back in Maputo, the international community has made a solemn promise to mine victims that unlike the destruction of emplaced or stockpiled mines, efforts to support fulfill this promise must continue for years. And in 1999, again, express that a comprehensive approach to victim assist assistance is required and how efforts shall be part of broader approaches to healthcare, rehabilitation, and human rights. As a developing, democratic, and peaceful country, Mozambique is committed to ensure full participation of all citizens, including mine victims, in the social, cultural, economic, and political life of the nation. Before I conclude, I would like to state that the Maputo Review Conference taking place in June in Mozambique is an opportunity to again leverage high level international interest to keep momentum in the efforts of landmine victims assistance. The anti-landmines movement has advancing, is advancing, and it is a different and it is at a different stage than it was 15 years ago. We have to congratulate ourselves for this effort. The user, the United States of America, sorry, has embarked 
on steady steps towards the ban of antipersonal landmines. We note with satisfaction that United States landmine policy review, the letters of support addressed to the Obama administration for the US to join the mine ban treaty from the treaty states, parties, and others, as well as the fact that it has not produced, used, exported landmines, and has not plans for future procurement. We therefore encourage the Obama administration to engage towards joining the convention. We believe that a decision from the United States of America to join the convention would provide an incredible boost to our efforts. So we would be delighted if the United States were to take its rightful place around the table with all countries that have formally signed the treaty and accepted the anti-personal mines uh, banning. We look forward to welcome all of you in Maputo, the pearl of the Indian Ocean, to uh, continue with our efforts to uh, eradicate from Earth this scourge of the landmines. I thank you all. Mary's asked me to say a few words, but I, I, I think uh, what we, we need to do is to thank you all for coming here this morning and, and paying such a close attention to, uh, to our excellent speakers and panelists. Um, a special thanks, I think, to our last speaker, uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Mozambique to the United States for coming here and uh, representing her country and uh, her Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, who's about to take on a very weighty responsibility of taking the Any Personnel Mind Ban Convention to its, uh, to its next phase, to its next chapter, by again hosting the convention. Thank you very much. You're free to go. We're done. Thank you. <laughs>